Welcome to Humanizing Healthcare, where we talk with innovators and thought leaders who are working to make healthcare experiences more compassionate and rewarding for all. Our host is Chris Malone, founder of Fidelum Health and author of the award-winning book, The Human Brand, how we relate to people, products, and companies. Hi, I'm Chris Malone, and I'll be your host for today's discussion. Thank you for joining us. We'll be talking with Greg McCool, the Chief Transformation Officer at NRC Health. Greg is also the founder of Patient Wisdom, which is now part of NRC. Welcome to the program, Greg. Thanks, Chris. Great to be with you today. To get us started, Greg, can you tell us a little bit about your role at NRC? Sure. I'm the Chief Transformation Officer, and I run something called the Human Understanding Institute, which is a small group that's dedicated to helping internal and external audiences take a broad view of experience, really think about all the life that happens outside of the care setting, uh, and help organizations turn aspiration into action. Excellent. Sounds fascinating. So i um, curious, is there kind of a story that you can share about how you chose a career in healthcare? Uh, sure. I, uh, I've always been fascinated by health and medicine. Uh, and uh, after college, I went up to Boston and did research at Mass General, it's sort of a typical thing that one does when uh, one's thinking about potentially going to medical school. And uh, the public TV station up there put out a call for a fellowship to teach journalists to do documentaries about health and medicine. And I was like, ooh, that's really interesting to me. And that made me just realize that I was interested in doing something about around health and medicine, not doing clinical care. And so um, after uh, a little bit, I, I moved to New York, started writing about healthcare, and then went to grad school and did my PhD in communication at Northwestern, and then went on the faculty at Northwestern's medical school, uh, and, and actually became the only person, I think, on earth who's a PhD in communication, a full professor of medicine. Um, and uh, after 15 years there, went to see if I could make my ideas work in the real world, uh, became a chief innovation officer at a health system in Connecticut, and then went off and started Patient Wisdom. And then we joined forces with NRC Health about two and a half years ago. Fascinating background, fascinating background. Particularly your background as a professor of communication. I think it you know, offers a great deal of perspective for the work that you're doing now. Over the past few years, it seems like there's been this kind of growing interest in the idea that healthcare needs to become more human. But, you know, NRC Health, my understanding is, has been focusing on deepening human understanding in healthcare since 2015. What do you know about how that came about and the significance of that? Well, I think NRC Health has been probably interested in it for even longer than that. But the this branding of human understanding has been something that's been visible for NRC Health since 2015. And I, I think it harks back to uh, their NRC's legacy, right? So it's been around for 41 years now, I think. Um, it started out as the National Research Corporation, uh, NRC, um, and has this this DNA uh, that is research-based, but very human-focused. And Mike Hayes, who's the founder and the CEO of, of NRC Health, is really, he's just a visionary leader. And he's always been thinking about how do we do the right things for the right reasons? And where he landed, I think, is this idea that behind every person is a story. And those stories need to be told and heard and used in uh, in healthcare to make sure that things are working as best they can for for everybody. Um, and it's interesting because when I first started talking to Mike about joining forces, uh, my first question to him is: Was is human understanding just a really good tagline, or are you guys serious? And we're really serious, and and I think that's that's fantastic. So the the it's the core to 
our vision, the core to our business is the, the fact that every person deserves to be treated as a unique person, right? As a human. And so what do you think has been going on the last few years? Is there anything in particular that has caused this kind of prevalence of kind of becoming more human, kind of seeing it up more and more? Do you think that's in response to anything in particular, or has it always been something that was needed? Is that something changed, or what do you think? Well, it's a, it's a good question. I mean, you wrote a whole book about this, right? So we could talk about this for a while. But the it, my sense is that the this feeling like the need to humanize care, it's just never been more apparent but it's always been there, right? And part of it is what happened in the pandemic, but burnout was happening even before then. It just got worse during, during the pandemic. And patients starting to feel like, do they understand that I'm an actual human, <laughs> right? Um, was, was also kind of increasing over time. And so I think it just, you know, we've, we've landed in a space where people and from every angle are realizing how important it is to get back the the humanity that used to be um, part and parcel of healthcare, right? I mean, really nobody went into, as far as I know, nobody went into healthcare to just churn faster transactions, but that's what it feels like, I think, uh, for too many clinicians and too many patients. I think to your point, I think that it is a result of some things that have happened over the 20 years with the technology, the degree to which things have become more digitized, automated, remote, or what have you. I think it's a little bit of a reaction to that. We've even seen the term human used in banking and a variety of other things. So I do think that, you know, that has played a role a little bit, at least. I think so. We did, you know, we did one of the very first studies when I was at Northwestern. I don't know if it was the first, but that's certainly one of the very first studies on the effect of the electronic health record um, on doctor patient encounters. And that it changes the game big time, right? It has a it has an amplification effect. And and that's um, that's carried through. Yeah. So tell us um, a little bit about the background on patient wisdom, which by definition was very technology oriented. How did patient wisdom come about and how does it connect to human understanding? Sure. Well, we did uh, so much research and we're, I mean, not just my group, uh, but certainly others in the, in the field over the, the past few decades to really get a handle on what it takes to have an effective clinical encounter. And what we built with patient wisdom was a, a way to make that a more reliable process through a simple digital tool. Um, and I should say, you know, I say simple because it's it looks simple, but it's <laughs> which is the point, right? Yeah. Um, user experience is is really great, but but there's a lot of complexity behind the scenes, and it's integrated into the EHR, so clinicians have a sense of what matters to patients, what they're up against, what they're trying to achieve. Um, they get that sense in 15 seconds, uh, something that's auto launched into the EHR. So they don't have to even click on anything. And what we are seeing in some of the studies that we've done since is that they go in, they do a better job and they save time. And you know, when we brought it into NRC, we, we, it's no longer called patient wisdom, it's called my story. Um, and essentially what patients complete uh, is my story. And then what shows up in the EHR is my view. Um, and regardless, the, the idea is that if we give patients a chance to share what matters to them and give clinicians a chance to see that, uh, we are making effective clinical encounters happen more reliably, right? We, we know what it takes to make them happen. Um, it's just that when clinicians, get, and we're really good at teaching people to do that, right? But when clinicians get really busy and their wheels are turning very fast, sometimes the things that they know to do and that they want to do fall by the wayside. And similarly, when patients go in, even things that they, I know I wanna tell them this, right? Those sometimes drop out of the picture too. So this is a way to make sure that the information is there and usable and useful in the moment. And I think what's great about it is that it's a use of technology that does not distract from the interaction between the clinician and the patient. It's something that enables that to be more 
meaningful, right? It, it's not something that takes both of them away from that discussion. It, it enables the clinician to be better prepared and to tailor that experience, you know, more so, which too often the technology is used as a substitute for that interaction, not rather than an enabler of it. Well, exactly so. I mean, I'm a communication guy, right? So, so the last thing I wanted to do was create a really great tool to supplant communication. So what this does is it focuses communication on what's important, it doesn't replace it in any way. Yep. And so, you know, if we're able to make care experiences more human, what do we think of the benefits of that? You know, you know, from your experience, whether it's with patient wisdom or NRC or what have you, what are some of the tangible things that you've seen come out of the uh, enablement of that more productive interaction? Well, I think, you know, not to be paint with too broad a brush, but it's, I think it's a fair statement. I think everybody benefits from this, right? So, and, and I'm talking about humanizing healthcare uh, writ large. So the, Patients obviously benefit because people are paying attention to them as unique people. Uh, and that is, it's much more likely that we're going to be able to meet their needs if we're paying attention to them one by one by one, right? And then of one, um, then as a segment or a type for people that look like you or sound like you or whatever, right? So that in and of itself is a major benefit. There's also an incredibly beneficial side to it for clinicians, the people and the people on the front line working with patients. Um, we we hear all the time once they they start working on this kind of human understanding front, is this is why I went into medicine or this is why I went into nursing, right? It's to have these connections and help people, right, move toward their goals. And then I think thinking even more more broadly, which I'm always trying to get people to do, right, is there's there's benefit on both sides of the stethoscope, not just, oh, it feels good to be doing this work, right, and it's kind of re, refilling the cup or, you know, bringing joy to practice, fuel for the soul, whatever you want to say, but there's also benefit in paying attention to what matters to the people on the front line, right, so if you're going to ask them to pay attention to what matters to patients, then if the organizations are paying attention to them, right, that, that kind of old, older idea of patients come second, right, um, which is simply put that if, if we're not paying attention to what matters to the people on the front line, it's really hard for them to pay attention to what matters to patients, um, then, then we're, we're doing the right thing if we're starting there. Yeah. And I think the other thing that it's enabling by making that personalization, the connection for both the clinician and the patient, it's enabling relationships, really. Uh -huh. And that that's a characteristic of a relationship that I know you, I know what matters to you. I personalize my conversation with you is a key characteristic of any relationship. And I think it, that is, is one of the things that both patient and clinician benefit from as well. Now, um, are there any examples you can share of providers, you know, who have started to use, you know, um, this personalization approach and, and some of the results that they've seen, what can you share with us that might be a good example of the benefits? I have a really good example to share with you, but I want to just follow up on something you just said, because I okay. think it's really important. Um, we did a lot of work to understand what people think about human understanding and how they, how they understand it, how, what it would look like in the, in the real world, right? So what are the behavioral signs of human understanding? And, so I asked them, like, how would you know it if you saw it, right? We did a series of very diverse focus groups. And what was interesting is we got all sorts of comments, behavioral signs, right? Things like see me as me, pay attention to the big picture of my life, right? Tailor care to me, that kind of thing. And when we stepped back and looked at this long, really rich list, what we saw is they fell into three buckets, which were connect with me, listen to me, and partner with me, right? So I just want to be clear that we're, you know, we've been talking to kind of a high level, like human sure. rights care, right? That sort of thing, that these things are doable on the ground and they're recognizable to patients. So, so I just want to start there. Now, um, you asked for an example. We did a, a randomized control trial on, uh, on, my story, right? Um, and we found that 
for patients and clinicians that were using this, we found double digit gains in the proportion of patients who said that their doctor treated them with respect, showed interest in their ideas, showed care and concern, and spent the right amount of time with them. And the clinicians were telling us, we're not spending any longer, it's just better time, right? So this is the kind of thing that is telling us that it's doing what it's supposed to do, right? Um, and I think concomitant with that, this is also a direct line to health equity, right? So if we're paying attention to what each individual person is trying to achieve is up against, then we are, we are, we're doing this, right? We're, we're moving toward making sure that nobody's left behind from that point of view, right? Um, and I think that's, that's the goal overall. Many organizations are struggling with staffing levels, engagement, retention, things of that nature. Have you seen examples of where this approach is helping to address that gap as well? Or, or what, what are you seeing in that regard? Well, I think one of the most interesting things that, that we've been working on lately is uh, complement sharing, right? So everybody, I think they I don't know if everybody, but there's, you know, there's certainly a pervasive um, feeling that when that patients, if they're going to leave a comment, it's a negative comment, right? Mm. That sort of thing. And we've seen that there are overwhelmingly positive comments about the, the clinicians and the, the, you know, the folks on the care team. So we developed a way to, uh, to make it easy to share compliments. And why, why is that important? Well, it's a couple of components there are, are important. One is sharing them. The other is making it easy right? Because there are organizations that have been sharing compliments for quite a while, but you have to imagine that they're doing it with like Excel spreadsheets and scissors and, you know, and construction paper and that kind of thing, right? So it's been a very manual process and we've made it a highly automated process now. So you can essentially, you still have to click a button, but, but the, uh, that, those compliments will go if they were about a certain person, they will go to that certain person. If they're about a, a clinical setting, right, an area um, where you don't know the people, then um, it'll go to that area, right? So these are things that are definitely along those lines of what I mentioned before in terms of the fuel for the soul, right? So being able to see um, what other folks, I mean, what the people that you've been taking care of are saying you did for them, right? Um, is really is just lifting people up, and and you, I'm sure, folks on this call have probably seen videos of, uh, you know, clinicians reading um, comments from patients or families, and just you know weeping, right? Because it's so powerful to to get that sort of feedback loop validation that we really are changing lives here. Outstanding. Now, given what you've seen and the kind of vicious cycle that some providers are in with staffing impacting patient experience and things like that, are there any kind of low hanging fruit or starting points that you would advise to perhaps others that might be on the call? Here are three things you might want to start looking at to try to turn the tide, if you will. Anything that you would suggest in the way of kind of a starting approach? Um, I think simplifying things. <laughs> um, so it's certainly, and I, I, I guess you could look at that on a few levels. First off, it's simplifying why are we here, right? And making it really clear that we, we know it's unrealistic to expect you to do 4,000 things every day, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so we have a small set of priorities as an organization. Uh, you could imagine something like connect with me, listen to me, partner with me as being, you know, like this is what we're trying to achieve here, right? In addition and along the way, um, right, in the, in, the, in the process of delivering high quality, safe care, right? But you can still do those things. Um, what I think a lot of organizations have run the risk of uh, over the years is 
that feeling of flavor of the month. Like, here's what we're doing now. Here's what we're doing now. Here's what, and nobody knows what, what are, why are we here? What are we really doing, right? Um, so simplifying what the goals are, I guess, is one thing. And then simplifying the workload um, or workflows, I should say. I mean, the workload is just real, right? Um, and so what can, what can organizations do to get things out of the way? And, you know, certainly the best people to ask are the people that are on the front line, right? They're the ones that are doing the workarounds anyway. So it would be good to ask them or start out by asking them, what can we do to co-design or co-develop uh, a better process here? And, and, you know, there are, a lot of it starts with the vision of, uh, of the people that are involved, right? I, I'll just give you a very quick example. Uh, this is a, an emergency room example, but you can imagine it applied to anything. So boarding in emergency rooms is a big problem, right? So if and what boarding means is some, somebody who's in the emergency room, they get admitted to the hospital, but they have to wait for a bed. So they're boarding in the, in the emergency room. And sometimes those people are, are hanging out in a hallway on a gurney for I mean, a crazy amount of hours. And it's nobody's fault really, okay? But it's, it's a systems problem. And you can imagine people saying, well, our average boarding time is five hours. We're gonna to try to get it down to four hours, right? That's still not good, right? It's a, it's a big change, but it's not good. And a different way to think about it is what would it take to make the only thing the patient has to wait for is for those elevator doors to open to get them up to the floor, right? You start thinking about it completely differently. And when you start thinking about it differently, instead of just like, how do we speed up or drop out, you know, one step or something like that, you start to say, we need to actually completely change the system. Right, and it's that you know the great Paul Batalden quote that every system is perfectly designed to get the results it gets. Right, and and, um, and I think that's that's the kind of thing that organizations need to do is to help people think beyond like let's get incrementally better to let's change the way we're thinking about this work so we can make sure that we're achieving the goals we want to achieve for our patients. Yeah, I think you touched on a number of really critical things there. One is kind of simplification as well as kind of process design. In the yeah. world-class organizations I've had the opportunity to work with or write about, you know, they don't have a 27-step checklist that tells people exactly what to say and what to do. Rather, they tend to have a handful of principles similar to what you described there. Here are the three things. Here are the four things that we're trying to accomplish. And we empower them to use the, their good judgment as to how to do that each day. But they're also really disciplined around process design so that it's easy to do the right thing as well. And I think those two things together make a huge difference. Yeah. Now, speaking of technology and process design and so forth, there's been a lot in the news, obviously, lately about artificial intelligence since the release of chat GTP and the impact they may have on healthcare and so forth. I'm wondering what you're thinking at, you know, from your own home or from NRC as what role that might play in simplifying things, you know, for clinicians, whether it's medical notes in the EMR or other things. What's, what's your take on this? Do you think that this is something that could be helpful or is there potentially more trouble than help here? It depends. <laughs> so um, it, it certainly has the potential to be super helpful in, in healthcare on, on many levels, but I think we've got to start by just acknowledging that at present, AI means all things to all people. Right. And it means a lot of things. I mean, there, there are so many different flavors and avenues, um, you know, ranging from chatbots, right? That's AI, natural language processing, that's AI, right? Machine learning is some kind of, is, is a kind of artificial intelligence, um, to things that have more of a, a logical reasoning kind of, uh, right? So there are diagnostic tools. Um, Thing, you know, reading images and, and, and uh, you know, those are just a few examples, but they're all forms of artificial intelligence. Um, so the ones that are 
uh, closer to the, um, I've got a simple answer, here's a simple, I mean, I got a simple question, here's a simple answer. Those are, are probably the most, you know, the closest at hand in terms of uh, providing benefit right now. But still, I think we've got to acknowledge another thing, which is there's kind of built-in bias to these, these models. I mean, whether they're large language models or anything else that's built on a large set of data, it's where did that large set of data come from, right? And so if, you know, if clinical trials are primarily on white males, right? Then we've got a problem with what, 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 what's gonna happen here. And, you know, maybe the models can build in, uh, you know, some, some adjustments for, for that kind of thing. But we have to acknowledge that bias is built in to the data that these things are drawing on, right? They're not making stuff up. They're, they're drawing on uh, a corpus of data and that's, I mean, they, they need to, right? And so as that data gets, as that corpus of data gets better, um, the, you know, the, the learning will increase and the models will get better. Uh, but we're not we're not there yet. I mean, all the hype around Chat GPT. I mean, it's well deserved hype, but it's uh, it, you know it's pretty amazing. Uh, but we've got a we've got a ways to go to make sure that these things are going to be all the various things are, are that are envisioned are going to be useful in healthcare and and safe. Right? You can have very significant unintended consequences of steering things in the wrong direction. Yeah, it's a good point. And I've read recently that, particularly for these generative models that use large language processing, that even to the developers, it's not entirely clear sometimes how the process is working. It's a little bit of a black box even to them. And so that's never a reassuring sign. <laughs> true, true. So um, changing gears, I understand that NRC has a human experience conference coming up in mm -hmm. August in Boston. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, it's a it's our annual event. It's uh, it's been renamed this year, um, Human Understanding Beyond the Hub, uh, and it's it's such a good vibe there. I have to say, um, very generous and conversational, uh, and the the main stage sessions are always great. And then we've got, I believe, this year there are three tracks. There's an executive track a fundamentals first track and a consumerism track. And uh, those are, you know, people kind of choose their own adventure and, and uh, split up and go to those. Uh, the, the overall, uh, I guess, vision for the, for the hub is to make sure that everybody has a chance to talk with each other, right? Um, not just sit there and listen, but talk with each other and bat ideas around and learn from each other um, as they go. I, I, I really, this is, you know, been to plenty of conferences and events, and, and this is one that I think uh, comes off very, very well. Terrific. Greg, I'm wondering, is there a particular quote that is a favor of yours? And if so, why? <laughs> huh. Um, yeah, I'll give you I'll give you a, a real one. Um, so I would say that this may be actually my favorite quote of all time. Um, it's all you can do is all you can. Um, and if you think about it, that that's got a few meanings built into it, right? Um, that so the the why, right? Um, so all you can do is all you can. You got to do everything you can. Right, so do the best you possibly can, but you can't do everything. Right, you can't solve everything, um, and and I think that that is just uh, those are some pretty good words to live by. Let's put it that way. Excellent. I think we've run the course, Greg. I think we've run the course. Nice. Hey, we can't thank you enough for your time and your insight today. It's really great to hear about all the things that you're implementing at NRC, and we look forward to hearing more innovations in the future. To our listeners, thank you for joining us as well. We hope you found this discussion informative and inspiring. We'll be posting a recording of today's program on YouTube, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. Be sure to join us for our next Humanizing Healthcare discussion with Dwight McBee, 
the Chief Equity and Experience Officer for Jefferson Health. We will be exploring how greater health equity elevates both patient experiences and caregiver engagement. Thanks for listening today. If you enjoyed this episode of Humanizing Healthcare, please give it a rating, share it with others, and follow us at Fidelum Health on LinkedIn. And make sure you join us next time as we share more insights from another inspiring healthcare leader and innovator.